Before we start our worship this morning, we'll just go through our announcements as we usually do. Uh, we had our congregational meeting, so that was the first announcement. And then on July the 22nd, we're having an ice cream, cream social. That date has been changed. I forgot what the original date was now, but we changed that to the 22nd. Probably waiting on hotter weather. I think that's what that was for. Right? Well, I had a wedding. I got a wedding. Oh, that's right. You got a wedding to do oh, for that next Saturday. So uh, Jerry didn't want to miss the ice cream social, so he rescheduled that. <laughs> I don't blame him. So remember the ice cream social for July the 22nd. Also, as far as... Uh, other things, there's someone getting older on the birthday list, but I probably don't want to mention them. No, it's me. <laughs> it's me. I'm going to be 13 on the 13th. So, uh, <laughs> Wanda says I act like I'm 13. Me and Lane, we're right there together, right? So, so uh, thank you for any birthday wishes there. So, And Bobby's be getting older a little bit next week, so we'll talk about that next week. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> As far as prayer list goes, too, we have some to add to that. Remember Sharon, Ms. Sharon Harden. She uh, has been having some chest pains. Pete tells me she's doing okay, but she's still having some pains and goes for a test in the morning, a stress test. So uh, be praying for her and praying for Pete as they go through that. And uh, I guess I'll be one of the first things in the morning, I guess, too, huh? At 1030. So let us know how that turns out. We'll be praying for her on that. They can do a lot of marvelous things now with that, with the heart and chest pains and so on. So we continue to remember Miss Sharon. And then Miss Minnie Lou's not feeling the best in the world, but she's here with us this morning. We're thankful for that. Continue to pray for Minnie Lou. And also for Miss Sue, continue to remember her. Jerry goes for tests on Thursday. So remember Jerry, Jerry as he goes for some tests and uh, pray for him. Continue to remember Pee Wee and Kim on our prayer list. And Mr. Tom, he's with us this morning, doing a lot better. We praise God for that. But, uh, still having some soreness in his knee, I'm sure, so pray for him also. And Miss Vicky had surgery this week. Doug tells me she went in, had the surgery that morning, like by 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock or something. 7, Seven o'clock. They took her down, did the surgery. Yeah, and surgery at 9. Surgery at 9. Walked, walked had hip surgery, and at 2 o'clock, walked out. That same day on a walker. So that, that is incredible. God has given her strength to go through that. And pray for Marilyn, too. Marilyn's been with her every day since, helping take care of her. And uh, I think it's putting a toll on Marilyn as well. You know, that's a lot of work. So pray for Marilyn as well. But praise God that Vicki did well through that surgery. Then we have Miss Lily Sue Hammett, who has lung cancer. Pray for <coughs> Lily Sue Hammett. Also Mike Prevatt, who has cancer. Remember him. And Miss Mary Jane, we don't forget her. Continue to pray for her. God will continue to strengthen her. And then pray for my family as we travel next week. We'll be leaving Saturday morning for our vacation. And uh, it's me and Wanda and, and uh, Amber and her husband and the two grand boys and a couple other folks, Eric. And we got a crew going. So, <laughs> so pray for us as we travel that God would give us traveling safety and patience with each other too. So. And I think that's all I have on here, unless you have others we need to add to this, or we need other things to know. Brenda. Oh, Brenda's back. That's right. That's right. Miss Brenda's back. She's seeing much better now. She's got a dilemma, though. Her license says she has to wear eyeglasses, and the doctor won't give her any yet. So I uh, pray that Brenda will drive safely. <laughs> that's what Jerry said, just knock the glass out of them, right? <laughs> So we are thankful that, that Brenda's back with us and that uh, God has given her some good eyesight there and good healing on that as well. So it's good to have Brenda back with us. Anything else? Oh, and then uh, Connie's daughter, Katie, won second place in the dessert contest at the Peach Festival. That is great. That is great. So we know a star now. So, uh, and she won first place at the Mighty Moo. First place at Mighty Moo. You didn't bring that dessert with you this morning, did you? <laughs> Oh, they give, oh, okay. <laughs> the judges reached the rest of it, right? I had to share it with Reggie. <laughs> no, <laughs> I had to share it with Reggie. Oh, no. <laughs> well, that's right. Oh, good, good. Jerry said we know who to get desserts from now if we need one. <laughs> Better make a big one, though, yeah. We can eat some dessert, can't we, Frankie? <laughs> well, that was good that you were kind to Reggie and shared with him. That was nice. <laughs> Anything else? Well, if not, let's start our service this morning as we look to our God in prayer. Let's pray. 
Oh God, our Heavenly Father, again, we do thank you so much for the blessings you have poured out on us. You are so good and so rich to us, O oh Lord, and we just thank you for that. Help us now as we come to worship you this morning, how we pray that you would open our hearts, that you would open our ears and our eyes, and feed us, O oh God, upon your word as we come before you. And our God, we thank you so much that you have taught us well on how to pray, that we come, can come before your throne and pour our hearts out. Be with us now as we pray the prayer together that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. I'd like to thank Edna too. She's, uh, if y'all notice, she disappears. But she's my engineer in the back <laughs> until Carlton gets back there. And uh, I try to get her to be my engineer at the house, but uh, she flat turned me down and says, Nope, no way I'm going to get in your mess. <laughs> so uh, she didn't uh, really appreciate me reading some of the Cinda Edna story, and uh, so she wouldn't be part of it. But I'm thankful that she uh, does that back there for us. If you turn your Bible to chapter of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 35, going through 10.8. That's Matthew, chapter 9, beginning with verse 35. And I'm going to do like sometimes I do. I read from the scriptures and expound upon it. So let's look at the Word of God here, what He has to say to us, uh, starting with Ma uh, Matthew chapter 9, verses 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. This is part of Je uh, Jesus' ministry. This is something that He teaches us. He's teaching in the synagogues, and you know how the synagogues was really against Jesus. They thought he was a false prophet and thought that he didn't have a message to bring, but the people were there, was there and seen that Jesus was either a prophet from God or the Son of God. But mainly they were there for the healing. He healed every sickness and every disease among them, so they would flock to the synagogue. Now, if Jesus was here as the healing uh, people and touching them like some of these uh, television ministers sometimes have, that they're doing it on their own instead of uh, God getting the glory, they kind of get the glory themselves and people falling out and miraculously walking and all this stuff here, we would have a packed house. But we don't give false hope. Jesus did not give false hope. He delivered when he was there in these synagogues. In verse 36, he says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as a sheep having no shepherd. He had compassion. Jesus had a lot of compassion for us. We have a lot of sickness in our congregation. We have a lot of things that come up in our lives that, as we get older that creeps in that really freaks us out. But Jesus has compassion upon us, and he will be there with us. Now, he might not touch us and heal us right then. He might have other things that he wants to do with that uh, uh, stuff in our bodies that's going to glorify him, that's going to help someone else see, wow, that is a follower of Christ. That is a follower of Jesus. So I'm letting that person either have that disease or either have that person, I'm going to take that disease out. So it's for God's glory and not for our glory. But God will be with us because he has compassion on us and he'll be with us through our times of trials and troubles. Now in verse 30, 37, he, said, he then said unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. That is a strong message to us. The harvest, we look around us, look in this community, look just around in our neighborhood. The harvest is plenty there, isn't it? It's almost like katsu growing. And you know how fast that grows. And if it's everywhere. 
So the harvest is there. But it's only a few of us that labor to go out and to bring the people the gospel. We bring the gospel here, but do we take it outside these doors, outside these windows? If you have a garden, which some of you do, if you did not do anything with your garden after you planted it, the weeds would take over. If you didn't take your fruits off of it, tomatoes and things like that, well, it would go bad. So Jesus uses this analogy here to let us know that the harvest is big out there. But we only got a few laborers. Now, in verse 38, he says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into this harvest. We should be praying that God will send us out into the harvest. That he will send us out to spread the gospel. And we might be thinking this. We might be thinking that the gospel's everywhere. Everybody's heard the gospels. They see Christmas pageants. They hear it on the radio. They see it on TV. They don't need me to come out. Yes, he does. I imagine they said the same thing in the synagogue as all the others there to saying, what? Look at all these people we've got in church here. Look at all these people we've got here. We're, we're doing good here. But Jesus is telling them that pray that God will send more laborers. There's a lot of false teaching out there. There's a lot of messages going out into this harvest. It's not true. It's confusing, which makes more people pull away from God, pull away from the church. They don't know the urgency of their lives. They can be taken away at any moment, and not knowing God is disastrous. Kind of falls back on us. So we should pray in our prayers every day that God sends more laborers and that God will send us into the communities, into our neighbors. I know when I get all these test things and other things situated with my health like that, aggressively I'm going to start in this community. Aggressively. And you know, knocking on the door one time, and they say, well, we're not really okay, we're not here or whatever, we're not interested. Not the next time. And the next time. Till they sick the dog on you anyway. We've got to be aggressive. Because there's people's souls in this community that is not going to heaven. And we don't want that on our hands. We don't want that as a congregation on our hands here. In our meeting here, we, we start in a new chapter at Beach Street. And we can start this new chapter by evaluating what are we doing for this community and inviting them to hear the gospel in this church. In chapter 10, he says, And when he had called unto him the, his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits, to cast them out, and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, we don't want to go into people's houses like that and say, Jesus has commissioned us, who's sick in the house? We're going to heal them right now. Anybody got a, like a spirit upon you that's pounced upon your evil spirit or something like that? We can cast them out. We've been commissioned to cast out unclean spirits. And heal, heal all manners of diseases. Now, we'll probably get tossed out of the house pretty quick. Jesus has given the disciples this healing on spirit, but that's not what the main purpose is. He said, I want you to go and spread the gospel like he was doing about the kingdom of God that Jesus has come, and that's what he wanted them to do, mostly. God can snap his fingers, speak it, 
and all disease and all healing will be done. But what's that teach us? I think God's looking at it as saying, it teaches us if he did everything for us, we'd be lazy, wouldn't we? If we had somebody in our household that would did everything for us, I mean, what we'd have to do is sit there and ring a little bell to go fetch this, go get this. And then if we had to get up and go make a grilled cheese sandwich or something, we would complain a while, wouldn't we? Or we'd starve. This is teaching us like he taught the disciples. Now, in verse 2, it talks about the names of the 12 apostles. And we won't go into all the names here. It just gives a list of all the 12 apostles if you want to know uh, all their names. And, and, and one of the names in verse 4, Simon the Canaanite. I like that one. In the Old Testament, what happened to the Canaanites and Israel? They fought like cats and dogs. They had their God and they had uh, their principles and they was just disavowing uh, Israelites and, and holding them captive sometimes and all this going on, but here, Simon, the Canaanite. Jesus didn't look at gender. He didn't look at nationality. He didn't look at the color of the skin. Jesus chose his disciples by their heart. Now, in verse 5, he said, These twelve Jesus sent forth, commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, into any city of the Samaritans, enter not. Because they hadn't given them time. He wanted to get the Israelites, God's chosen people there, first choice of this. And he said it all through the New Testament. And of course we know that a lot of them rejected it, and then we come in as the Gentiles. And Jesus in verse 6 says, But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The house of Israel. The people that were lost. Now what he's saying to us now, I want you to go to the house of the lost here. The Gentiles. And if they happen to be an Israelite, that's okay too. But he said, go to them first. And he says in verse 7, And you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was at hand. Jesus was right there. Jesus is right here in spirit. God is with us in spirit. So when we go into the houses and knock and talk to people about coming to hear the gospel here and talk to them about Jesus, we tell them that the kingdom of heaven is here. Don't wait. Time is urgent. Listen to the world, our communities. We're always hearing about shootings and killings. Every day on the news, locally, we hear about killings, shootings. We hear about this. The time now is urgent for people to get right with God. We don't know if we will live tomorrow. God didn't promise that, right? We don't know that. But we know that we'll live forever with God in His kingdom when God comes into our lives. And this is the gospel that we have to spread. And Jesus told them also, now verse 8 says, Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. Raise the dead. Don't pop in in a funeral home and tell them you're going to raise the loved one back to life. You might be really embarrassed and be shamed. But you know what? If God moved you, if God moved you to do any of these things right here and you know it's from God, it'll happen. It happens nowadays. This is not just back in the disciples' days. God gives powers to individuals to do these things. He don't give powers to individuals to bring in masses, to bring in money, and to make a mockery out of it, to make and gain stuff for that person. 
God does it for His glory in secret ways. If God revealed to us the people that He has given this today, and they are silenced because you don't go brag about it. You don't do it for some kind of spectacle. But if God revealed that, you'll see a lot of people that God gave this power to today. He keeps it hidden because he don't want that type of mockery. Verse 9 says, Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. What he's telling them is, is don't go and taking a bunch of money with you or anything. You don't want to go in flashy thinking, well, that person thinks, well, you got a lot of money. I'm going to follow you because you got a lot of money. And people do that, don't they? What amazes me is that we got homeless people. We got people that's, that will go into a restaurant and not have enough money to throw them out. But you got someone, hey, here comes the mayor or here comes this big governor or an official or, or he's real rich. And he sits down to eat. Oh, no, you don't have to pay for that. It's on us. It's like the rich gets richer, doesn't it, right? And they'll give them things, hoping to get something down the road, which they never get from that rich person. They'll judge that person by the way they look. We hear that a lot. Oh, no, uh, not that person. That person's this and that. And they don't even know him. So you see, Jesus is telling them here and telling us, don't go flashy and don't expect any money from them either. He said, don't take script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for a workman is worthy of his meat. Don't go depending on someone else to pay you to do these things. God will provide these things for you. He don't want you to go and say, well, I'm going to go do this mission over here, but I'm going to have to have some money. Or go to somebody's house that's here, we're going to give you a little money here. No. Jesus is saying, I give to you freely the gospel. I give you freely all these things, and you are to give them freely. Don't put a burden on people that's already burdened. And we see that. And now some of the churches are getting to where they're dunning people. If they don't pay their tithes. They make a commitment for that year. And if they don't make it for each month that they said, they send them a bill or call them. I think we give from our hearts what God tells us to give. You say, well, I didn't give much. That's okay. You give a lot. Remember the woman to give the little penny? She gave a lot. She gave it from her heart. That's what God looks at. God provides. He's provided this church well. And we are very thankful for what God has done for this church. We might not be busting out the windows, leaped and bound, and every pew full, but spiritually we are growing. Spiritually God has blessed this church. As long as we're doing His will, as long as we're doing what He asked us to do, then God will continue to bless this church. That's why God's taking us to a next level, a next step. In verse 11, And into whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire who is worthy, where they abide till you go from there. And when you come into a house, greet it. God's telling them, it's no use to knock and go in this door of an atheist that's a devout atheist. What they want from you, the atheist, is, is to argue with you. They want to beat you down. They want to tell you what the scripture says, and it's a lie. They want to tell you all that right there. I had experience, as you know, with the atheist. For two hours trying to beat God down, trying to discredit the Bible, trying to discredit Christianity and, and it's entirely, and asking and discrediting God. If there's a God, why is God letting this happen and that happen? If they knew God, then they would know because God would answer them. How can God answer someone that doesn't know him? 
And that's a good reason that God sends us out into the byways and he sends out to communities. We got people out here hurting, not understanding why a loved one's sick, not understanding that they lost their job, not understanding that they might be homeless, not understanding a lot of things in this world that's going on. They're confused. They have no one, no one to go to until we bring them the gospel of Jesus Christ, letting them know they have a person to go to. They have a God that will listen to them. They'll have a God that will be there for them. But if they don't know, guess what? They're alone. They're hurting. They're angry. They don't understand. And I say this for a truth from my own experience when I didn't know God. I didn't understand. When my father passed away and he was laying there, I wanted to find, there was a preacher who came and saw him, and I wanted to know, was my father going to heaven or hell? That's what I wanted to know. I was concerned about that. I heard about heaven and hell because I've been around other preachers and I've been around in the church once in a while. I darked in to maybe a girlfriend win or something like that because I didn't know God. But I wanted to know because I knew my dad never went to church. I know that he didn't have anything or say anything or read the Bible or pray. I never heard him pray. I never heard him involved nothing to do with God. But yet I wanted to find out. And when that preacher could not tell me whether my dad was going to heaven and hell, I was angry. I was mad. I was real mad. But as God matured me and God brought me his message, I understand why he could not tell me that. Only God knows. I can't sit here and preach and say, well, this person doesn't have God in their life and they die. They will go to hell and not say the same thing about my own father. Do I know for a fact where he's at? Only God knows. But by the scriptures and what I preach, sad to say, I don't think he is unless him and God talked before he passed away. It's the same thing with our own families. We have to look at our own families that does not have God in their life and the urgency of that. Where one day we won't question, or they or their loved ones won't question where they go. They will know. The message is sent, and God is going to send us into communities, into this community, into our families. We love our families. We love our cousins, we love our siblings, we love our children, our grandchildren. They should know about God. They should know how to come into God's house to worship. And it's our duty as commissioned by God to do this. And we give God all the glory, all the praise, Because it's Him. He saved us because He had compassion and loves us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for this message this morning. May You come to our hearts. Let us have that wisdom and knowledge, strength, Father, to go out and do Your will. We thank You, Father, for this church, the blessing that You have given us and the blessings that you've given this church and this community. We're thankful, Father, that you have compassion on us. In Jesus' name, amen.